Hello and welcome to another episode of Architecture for Kids podcast. I'm your host, Antonio Caplão. I'm a trained architect, an architectural educator and founding director of award-winning Architecture for Kids CIC. In this podcast, I'm going to talk to practitioners and creatives that share the same passion as I do, to inspire and to engage children and young people to shape their built environment and the creative industries. The podcast is brought to you in collaboration with the Built Environment Trust, the Thornton Education Trust and the Welsh School of Architecture, Cardiff University. My guest today is Dr. Iral Patel, Director of Engagement at the Welsh School of Architecture, Cardiff University. Dr. Patel's research and teaching aim to better understand clients and users of the built environment. She's interested in themes of learning environments, changing nature of work practices, social material practices, holistic building performance and adaptation of buildings. Having trained as an architect from India and practiced in the UK, a work has spanned from research, developing business processes and managing projects to technical building design. As Director of Engagement at the Welsh School of Architecture, Iral empowers staff and students to collaborate with children and young people in teaching and learning, research and outreach activities. Iral, thank you for coming to talk to me today. Thank you, Antonio, for having me. And firstly, congratulations on uh, this podcast series. I think you're doing a great, um, this is a great initiative and um, you're bringing together a, a community of practice uh, with a range of inspirational resources to inspire um, people in, like us in academia um, to to engage uh, with children and young people. One of the questions I ask all my guests to begin with is what were your favorite subjects at school and what were you good at if they were different? I know I wasn't good at maths. Uh, I really, I, I'm still not good at maths, I think. Um, the things I really enjoyed was probably... Um, we had a subject called social studies and it was understanding people and understanding culture and why and history and why things um, happen the way they happen. So I think I was more interested in people oriented subjects, uh, which is quite an interesting reflection. Now, thanks to your question, um, I can draw some parallels between what I'm interested in now and what I was interested in as a kid. Um, I believe that I'm really good at um, at working with people, uh, working on ish on topics related to people. It influenced your career? Do you think? Um, not consciously. I think it did influence um, the choices that I made, but. Again, growing up in India, um, and we were talking about this before we started the podcast, how I ended up in architecture because my father thought um, this was a, a profession that was suited to me as a girl. Um, and he wanted me to go to the university in my town. And I think um, I eventually ended up taking within the choice that maybe my father made uh, for my good or thinking about my good. Um was again around people and users and clients and how people interact with buildings. Well, there's two things there. One is the recommendation itself. You know, you following that is the fact that, you know, your father recommend, suggested you studied architecture. Yeah. I mean, um, the first part, me um, sort of in agreement with my father's um, uh, suggestion was... Um, I was brought up in a in a culture where um, they they I I believed that what my parents were thinking about me were always for my good and I trusted them. I don't know; it could have been different, but um, I at that point I think I trusted uh, my parents and I thought what they were suggesting was for my good. Um, and I took that, you know, I didn't really think of rebelling or <laughs> something. Uh, I, I think I was just. Um, okay, I, I, I trust you and I will go with that. I mean, 
it's like um, being a parent and being a coach or career coach at the same time. Uh, but the benefit is that the parent probably knows you a bit more. The second question regarding um, women and architecture, when, and when I started studying architecture, um, my father is in construction. And he still, he was and he is in construction uh, business. And he used to work with uh, an architect who was a female architect. And he thought um, architecture is a good profession uh, for a female uh, as compared to doing a civil engineering role uh, where you have to go on site and and, um, work in sort of harsh climate. Um, So he he had seen somebody in that role uh, and he probably respected her uh, and what she was doing and that's why he could imagine me continuing in that sort of profession or building my career in that profession so um yeah it's it's and uh we did have a high number in my cohort um we had a high number of female students as compared to to male students as well so i think that there was that sort of maybe um a shared um sort of um view of architecture as a suitable profession for um, for female uh, or for for women, also because I think there was this idea of flexibility uh, where if you have uh, kids or if you have a family, then you can still pursue your profession because it's it's flexible. You can set up your own practice. You don't have to be in nine to five job, uh, and you can work around your family commitments. So I think that that might have been another reason um, that that might have um, seemed attractive to uh, to my father and his peers or in terms of parents. And so uh, what made you come to uh, the World School of Architecture? And uh, let, tell us, let's talk a little bit about your role here as head of engagement. What does that entail? Yeah, um, the... The decision to come to the School of Architecture here in Cardiff University, um, there were multiple reasons. One of them was that I was trained as an architect, then I studied project management, then I worked as a project manager, then I did a PhD in a School of Management. But then I always felt like I had something in me which was more aligned with architecture as, uh, as an academic culture. And so it was It was trying to find a place for me, I think, in academia. And when the first uh, role that I took on here was our, um, looking after an MSc in Advanced Building Performance Evaluation. So, and I th- it wasn't technical. I think it was more coming from architectural perspective as compared to how it is commonly perceived um, in, in, the, in the field. Um, so that did attract me because I could see myself uh, or I could see myself fitting into an academic culture that was aligned with my interest and what I was doing it during my PhD. So that brought me here. uh, And also um, I hadn't taught studio by, by that time. So I thought, okay, this is another opportunity where you can explore studio pedagogy uh, and and I think that has been really great because I could then combine uh, my teaching with my research and it's more aligned and um, studio as, as a kind of a space to really further both research, uh, teaching and kind of pedagogical development. So the reason that I was inspired to take on the role firstly was um, I have been doing research using engaged uh, scholarship methodology where you do not work in isolation. You work with people, non-academic uh, businesses, um, government, uh, and you work with them together to um, develop knowledge. So I think that has been core to my um, way of being in academia and um, have been doing the the digital exhibition for the school during pandemic, which made me understand the diversity of work that the school does. So I was I was very inspired to 
capture the diversity where people are working on life projects, where people are um, working with uh, community members um, and and try and bridge that together with this role. Director of engagement isn't just an outreach role. I think that's another thing. Um, I wanted engagement or the golden thread of engagement to be running continuously through teaching, research, and outreach activities. So it's quite important that it's not seen as a bold on thing, uh, but it's sort of embedded within the core activities that we do as a school. And it is, and I think that makes my role easier because um, it's about then highlighting the work, the good work that's already happening and then um, supporting people uh, who are probably just on research contracts to think about engagement with, with children or people who are just maybe involved in teaching. Uh, how can their work support researchers to go and engage? So I think it's about building those sort of connections, which is great because um, I think colleagues in the school are, are doing amazing work and you're one of them. Uh, so it's it's great to to have people like yourselves in the school and it makes the role much more fun and and how shall I say, more rewarding. Is your work with children and youth engagement? And uh, uh, I know that one of the projects is that you sort of inherited, I suppose, is um, Shape My Street. And um, I'd like us to talk a little bit about, uh, you know, first of all, perhaps maybe you to tell us about what you think about the importance or the relevance of this type of work. And maybe we could talk a little bit about the project and the state, you know, uh, and at what kind of stage it is now. Shape My Street was um, was initiated by Ed Green, uh, who was previous director of engagement. And when I came into this role, I was quite keen to keep the things that work well and, and nurture it and make grow it. Um, and due to pandemic, uh, Shape My Street was unable to run uh, during, I think, 2019. Uh, to 2021 or maybe I don't exactly remember the years but yeah during pandemic the ship ship my street was unable to run and I was keen to rejuvenate it and Kelly is also very passionate uh, who's our outreach officer who is also very passionate to um about the project so um we we did um put in a grant application to scale it up uh, at the national level of uh, of Wales. But unfortunately, that was not successful. But what that application did was it started building connections with Cardiff Council and other partners. And um, now we are running uh, the Shape My Street competition this year um, with uh, support from Kelly, student ambassadors in the school, and working very closely with Cardiff Council in identifying the schools that we would like to engage in in this um, in this year, um, we have plans of how to take this forward. In the sense, uh, Wales has got a new curriculum uh, which um, aligns very well with the intent of Shape My Street. So currently, Shape My Street is extracurricular activity. But what we are hoping is that with support from Cardiff Council, we could um, develop uh, resources through co-creation workshops where teachers could come to university, engage with researchers and develop resources that are at the right level for the for the pupils. Uh, and then they are embedded within the curriculum that is a resource not just for Cardiff, but maybe throughout Wales. Um, so I think that would be something that that would help us really um, share and disseminate our research to uh, to young audience. And I think that's very important because research isn't something that is inaccessible. I think research is something that should be accessible regardless of which field you're working in or what age you are. And I think... Um, Taking shape my street to that next step uh, would uh, would put that in practice. So that's the that's the sort of um, future direction 
of, of Shape My Street, um, increasing its accessibility, both in terms of geographical coverage, but also in terms of um, making it accessible for young people and children to to participate and, and engage with research. And, and why do you think, uh, in your opinion, why is it so important uh, to roll out these kind of... Uh, uh, projects uh, or uh, into you know primary schools and you know and 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 so on and so forth. But this this we are at an important precipice. I think um, just started interacting with Chat GPT, and it's just amazed me as to um, what capabilities it can bring to the table and. I think in my interactions with ChatGPT, it has become clear to me personally that it's all about how you frame the question for it. It's all about how you frame the prompt for it. And um, I think that that requires critical thinking, that requires creative thinking and creative doing. And those are the skills that we probably need uh, the future generations to have. Um, and so I think we need to look at curriculum, not just in schools, but also in higher education um, and maybe lifelong learning in that sense, um, where we are probably, where, where we are actually developing um, skills that are more human and more um sort of not cookie in a cookie cutter way. I think they're more personal as well. So you have to find out what you're good at. That's why I liked your first question, I think. It's like, what are you good at? And how many times do we offer that sort of choice to a young young pupil who is going to the school saying, what are you good at? And if you're going to just study that subject, no, they have to study the whole range. And, and it's it's more like you have to fit the the square that, that has been given to you. So I think that's that's quite important that uh, activities like Shape My Street, they are based on making, they are based on creative thinking, and it also brings um, Howard Gardner's idea of multiple intelligences, where it's not just one thing about reading or writing, it's about uh, kinesthetic, it's about conversational, cultural, emotional, and it activates all those parts of us, I think. So uh, activities like this are really important um, for for young pupils, young pupils to really um, find their own path of how they want to learn. Uh, so it's because I think it's not just learning the content, but it's developing the skills of um, how to learn, how to think. And I think that's the sort of very fundamental to creating uh, a lifelong learning approach, uh, which we all are going to need in, in the future because we are going to change our. I've changed my career, I think, three times uh, in the last 15 years. So you have to be agile. And I think for that, you need to be reflective and you need to be um, able to identify I need to learn this. Uh, and how do I go about learning this? And I think exposing young people children and pupils and exposing uh, children and young audience to really experiment with these different ways of learning is, is very important. What do you think we need to kind of, you know, have this more widespread, this type of work? Something that the guardians and parents and, you know, and and that could be doing more about it? What What is in your opinion? Yeah, I mean, uh, that's a really important question. Um because, and I, I would go to that saying we have, which is, it takes a village to raise a kid. And I don't think it's the responsibility of one actor or the another. I think we need a collaborative and a joined up approach to uh, to education. And education is really important. Um, it's this role for the government in setting up the right policies and not maybe not being too prescriptive, but setting the agenda right, setting the mission right. Um, and then there's this role of um, 
changing the practice, which then comes down to to teachers and and schools in terms of how they are agile or how willing they are to change their ways of working and change um, their installed base, so to say, both conceptual, physical, installed base that we have got. Um, and then there's obviously parents and guardians, but it can it cannot be a sole responsibility of one actor or another. We need a joint up approach um, to education. And it's not just the actors that are the, how, how shall I say, primary actors related to education. We also need to bring in the secondary actors. So what kind of careers will this young child have? And it's, okay, what are the businesses doing and how can we engage with them in, in nurturing talent, in nurturing people? Um, and then there's this broader role of community here uh, in an intergenerational aspect as well, where we are breaking down the, the barriers um, between generations and uh, say, oh, you don't, you would never understand me. No, it's, it's, it's probably exchanging uh, experience and stories across generations. So I, I think it's, it's a more a system level question uh, in that sense, which has got all sorts of different connections and we need to start um changing those connections all together rather than one at a time because I think we will hit roadblocks if if we do change something and then it cannot scale up I think that's another issue if you do something really nice in one pocket how do you, how do you scale up and I think that's where um this more joined up approach is needed if if we were uh, to Kelly uh runs quite a lot of those events where she hosts um young children and uh, both from primary and secondary school uh, to come and visit us and she organizes those activities. Um, it gives them a chance to to come and experience uh, what it's like to be within a university building because uh, we might have um, pupils whose um, family members have never been to university and it's about breaking that barrier in a, in a sense that yes you can come to a university and it's it's a place for all so so that's one step of creating universities or uh, making universities uh, seem accessible to young people and then the second step is getting them enthusiastic about architecture and um, with when this when the pupils come here, Kelly organizes all these wonderful events um, and activities of creating bridges with, uh, with spaghetti and, and sticks and whatnot, which gets them, which is fun and creative and which really gets them excited uh, about, uh, about a career in architecture. And I would say that it's not just, what we're doing is not just um, ex getting them excited about a career in the profession, but I think what we are doing is getting them excited about design. And design in that sense is that broader umbrella of creative thinking, of um, working with different mediums, uh, of making connections uh, between unseeming or seemingly different things. And I think that's that's a huge success. If, if we can get young people inspired to be part of a design community um, who can think about issues in a creative way. I think um, we will be uh, we will be making a huge contribution to the society because design thinking could be then applied, and there's there's lots lots of uh, activity and lots of stuff written about design thinking um, applied to non design fields and and the contribution that it brings and I think if we can just maybe spark that way of thinking in the pupil who is coming to our school uh, even if they don't end up being an architect I think that would be a... What's the impact on the built environment? By getting young people confidence that you can have you can engage with your built environment you can even come up with an, a proposal 
I think that gives them immense confidence and a sense of agency. And in that, even if what they're suggesting at that moment in time, in when they are a young child in the school, it might not get acted upon. I think just having that sense of agency and that sense of confidence that um, I can have a say about the environment that I I inhabit in, I think that that's that's good. That that's really valuable, and it would make a difference. Maybe not at that moment, but maybe ten years down the line when they are maybe say um, as an economist, uh, but they can connect that. Okay, what impact does our way of our economic thinking has on environment? And it's about making them aware uh, about not just built environment, but I would say collective environment where we are talking about natural and the built environment together. And this is an idea. I mean, I'm going on off tangent, but this is an idea that we are developing in in a book that we are working on uh, around briefing. And I think it's so important that in current context of climate emergency, we're not just thinking about built environment, but of both natural and built coming together. And whatever field the the pupils end up being in, having that sense of awareness about the impact of their activities on environment, a collective environment, I think that is going to be an important um, value to instill, I think, in in young people. Is, is there a question I should have asked you, Amber, that I haven't asked you? And what is that question? Maybe it's not that you didn't ask me, but maybe we could probably go deeper into into that as to um, what what are the ethics and responsibilities of us as educators, um, not just HE or higher education educators, but educators as a more you know broader term uh, towards young people. And I think it's about giving them uh, opportunities to experience different things and giving them confidence to fail and take risks. And I think if that's so important when it comes to design thinking or, or design or architecture um, is, is to be able to do things differently and Maybe that's that's something that we as educators probably need to reflect a bit more and and think in our practice what can we do to to improve. Yeah. But I think it's really important mm-hmm. for for the work that that you are doing. Um, and I think I would also say that what you are doing is great because um, you are gathering uh, best exemplars uh, where we have broken down these barriers between academia and non-academia uh, where we have where you will be speaking to lots of interesting guests guests who are thinking about this very consciously about how we educate uh, next generation so I think your the work you are doing is 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 going to be really valuable for educators in in that sense to make us ask difficult questions and reflect on our own practice. Thanks, Antonia. Thank you very much to my guests today, to all the listeners, and please subscribe to Architecture for Kids podcast and leave your rating and a review. Recommend us to your friends and family. And to find out more about it, visit our websites, antoniocaplan-portfolio.co.uk, buildingcenter.co.uk, thorntoneducationtrust.org, cardiff.ac.uk and follow us on Instagram, Arch for Kids CIC, Twitter, Ant Kaplan, LinkedIn, Ant Kaplan, C-A-P-E-L-A-O and please join me again next week for another episode of Architecture for Kids podcast brought to you in collaboration with the Built Environment Trust, the Thornton Education Trust and the Welsh School of Architecture, Cardiff University.